Hello guys. Don't forget about these girls. We still have missing uh, work hard to get them noticed. I have fell behind a bit on my research, but hopefully we'll get back to my girls soon. So right now I'm kind of taking a little break from the series that I've been working on. Not really a break, but from the video. And before we get started, I would like to ask you guys to please subscribe and like. Hit the notification bell. I'll try to make this quick as possible. So that helps the channel out. I know a lot of channels that I watch, I go out of my way when I do get to push like and subscribe and say hello occasionally. So right now, there is the podcast that surfaced. Thanks to Kay Woodcock's daughter, Kesha. And I kind of wanted to do a commentary of that. But before we do, please listen to what Chad and Lori grew up listening to. Years, in a spirit of love, members of the church have been counseled to be thrifty, self-reliant, avoid debt, pay tithes and generous fast offerings, be industrious and have sufficient food, clothing, and fuel on hand to last at least one year. Today, there are compelling reasons to re-emphasize this counsel. We heard it done effectively in that great welfare meeting this morning. I emphasize the most basic principle, home production and storage. Have you ever paused to realize what would happen to your community, our nation, if transportation was paralyzed? Or if we had war, depression? How would you and your obtain food? How long would the corner grocery store or supermarket sustain the needs of the community? For the final inning, some of his strongest children who will help bear off the kingdom triumphantly. You are the generation that must be prepared to meet your God. There has never been more expected of the faithful in such a short time, a short period, as the is of us. In America, another portion is already gathered together as a civilization that is currently lost or hidden from the rest of the world in a place referred to as the North. This group is called the Ten Tribes, or the Lost Tribes. Jesus visited their nation after he visited the Nephite nation. They have their own records and scriptures. The church does teach about the second coming, but when? ...of Israel when they too physically gather to the New Jerusalem. The president of the church holds the keys to lead them from the north. These things are all explained in plain, simple, and clear... Now we'll read from the Latter-day Vision given in 1 Nephi, chapter 14. For the time cometh, saith the Lamb of God, that I will work a great and a marvelous work among the children of men, a work which shall be everlasting, either on the one hand or on the other, either to the convincing of them unto peace. So, as you can see, Chad and Lori have grown up attending church, which they prepare them for the second coming of Christ. Sometimes they say it's going to be soon, but they don't really put on a calendar a date. So when we hear them talk um, in this case about their connection to the LDS, how exactly are they connected and what's not part of the doctrine they teach? And we'll go over that soon. But for now, I want you to listen to this podcast and then we'll talk Jesus about Christ, it. We want other people to know there. He's just waiting for us. And so we want to talk to Chad about his personal experiences with the Savior. For he's had many experiences because of his near-death experiences, and I'm sure more personal ones as well, that he has seen our Savior, and he wants us to know that Jesus wants us to come unto him and to come to know him. So we're here with Chad Daybell, and he is on our Feel the Fire podcast today, and we really want to talk to Chad about his experiences with Jesus. And we know that you've had some pretty amazing experiences, and that's what we're here to do, is to testify of Jesus and who he is and who he is to us. So, Chad, hi. Hello. Glad to be on the podcast with you. Thank you. We're excited to have you, and happy that you could come on with us today. 
why don't you start with like your first experience is with Jesus and kind of who he is to you okay I grew up in a Christian home but honestly other than Sunday we didn't really talk about Jesus at all my parents grew up in the 60s and they were doing a good job as parents but religion always kind of took a back seat to everything else but when I was 18 years old, I decided to serve a mission for my church. And as part of that, we went to a training center. And my first real experience with Jesus was about two weeks into that training, mm -hmm. where one of the other missionaries read a poem about how Jesus came to earth to sacrifice for us so that we could someday return and live with him. And made me feel closer to Jesus than I ever had. It, it made him feel like a, a real person to me. He wasn't just a painting on the wall or, or somebody that we said at the name, his name at the end of a prayer. And so I just started bawling and the rest of the missionaries thought I'd lost my mind or something. But I could not stop crying and the burning in my chest was so strong that I finally could feel a connection to Jesus that I'd never felt before, and he felt like a friend to me. And so as I went out into the mission field, I carried that with me, even during the hard times. And there were times where it felt like the Savior was standing right there with us as we talked to people. So how many of you were surprised to hear um, this lifelong Mormon had never been really that close to Jesus Christ? That was even surprising for me because he seems to be this lifelong, if you read his books, they mislead you into thinking that he's always been a man who was very close to the word of God. So he's kind of feeling like he's getting closer to Jesus when he's on his mission, where is also where he starts to uh, feel like he can become a little bit more open about his visions, which is weird, because his timeline's starting to kind of mess up. Anyways, let's continue with the podcast. And I felt I just needed to pray and get a confirmation that I was really doing the right thing, giving up college for a couple of years. And so I went into a our bathroom and said a prayer and I did see I believe absolutely that I saw a vision of Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father as they appear um, they looked a little different than the paintings mm. that we see but I knew it was them and they were comforting me and gave me encouragement to move forward um, wow. as we talked about on our other podcast that I did with you and Jason now. I talked about a near-death experience I had in which I was about 23 years old and I was down in San Diego, California and I went out on a rocky ledge and was hit by a huge wave that knocked me down and it actually knocked me out of my body and I found myself standing talking to my grandpa who had died many years before and what he did was show me some scenes of future events and I never really said it publicly I guess but part of those scenes showed me talking in the future with the Savior and also my children talking with him and that he's the real living being that he will come again and I hope we can live the way we should that those visions I was shown can happen hmm. so, and, what and do you know, remember I, your feelings being like with him like being shown that like you were like his friend you were like talking with him you were working with him yeah it was uh, it wasn't a situation where we were like bowing down to him uh, he essentially treated us as friends 
He's certainly still above us in every way, but we were serving him, and so he looked at us as helping him, helping spread the gospel through the world. Huh. This, the visions I had show were after there was major tribulations in the world, and so it was a time of rejuvenation. We talk about a new Jerusalem. Huh. That's the era I saw, and that much of the world was in chaos and still in war and trial, but I was shown that Jesus will come even ahead of time before his second coming and help establish his people. And that's what I was shown is that my family will be able to help him and he'll be appreciative of us as we raise our families in righteousness. And he was glorious. Um, just as I've said before, the paintings don't really demonstrate the full power he has and the feeling so it's interesting he says he, he's always looked at the pictures of jesus but not really been able to relate to how powerful he was and that he was even real he's speaking about lots of tribulations in the world so what's interesting too is the fact that he's speaking about um in his early 20s visualizing this Jerusalem and Zion and so this is brought to his attention by Jesus himself and those visions the problem with this is um, some of his timelines start to break up for at least for me of when his visions really start especially when it's attached to uh, Zion the second coming of Jesus Christ I don't think Chad would realize that his role in the future would actually feed the fuel for many people to start investigating what he's truly following and what he's thinking, what he's seeing. And if for one person that can only concentrate on Chad Daybell, they're going to find out that things don't add up for him. Listen closely, guys, because especially in the podcast and then compare it to my videos that I load, Chad gives and drops hints that, well, it seems he's incredibly interested in anyways, his plan to lead all these people to, he calls his city. For those of you that's been following this story and know it pretty well, you know that he has been selling uh, or pushing to sell real estate in his area, so around his house, trying to build this kingdom for the second coming the majority of people who don't understand their religion and belief systems and you got to remember they're not following 100 percent the lds but many of their ideas and visions stimulate from that belief system though so many people believe that there's you know only one or two gathering spots when the second coming begins and people are going to start gathering to those you know, labeled safe spots. I haven't been able to go over it, and I will later in my videos, that LDS, they actually have different areas of the LDS members, and they have leaders over those small areas that they call stakes. And so there's going to be, as well, you know how many stakes there are. There's several. There's also going to be several gathering spots not just one or two and you're going to hear that chad is going to mention that jesus is coming before the resurrection before the second coming ahead of time to help them establish these places and to prepare people to spread the gospel to the world and you will hear that he mentioned several times that jesus will reach out directly to his entire family and it seems that he's insinuating that Jesus has given him some sort of leadership role within this organized community, which is organized by Jesus Christ himself. And so let's listen in a little bit more on the podcast. He's going to talk about and describe what Jesus looks like and what he is like. And pay attention to Lori's reaction. What you have when you're next to him, uh, just uh, radiant light comes off of him 
and yet he he can see his face clearly. It's not like he's obscured by uh, glorious light, but he just radiates happiness. There's a a joy in his eyes that you rarely see in anyone else on this earth, and a smile and a laugh that <laughs> kind of erupts kind of from his chest. You know, it's not just a giggle or anything. It's Mm -hmm. It's a full-hearted laugh, and he, it's a happy, happy laugh. And I just, he felt like a, a brother, but also we recognize that he is a heavenly being. But he was organizing us to build this city and to help the rest of the world come to understand the happiness that could be theirs. Did it give you a sense of peace as you saw those upcoming events, as he worked with you and others? Did it give you a totally different sense? Because most of those ideas might be a little troubling to see and witness. Uh, yeah, it was a feeling of peace for, for sure. Everyone had been through some really tough times just getting to that city required great sacrifice by people. There, you know, the economy had crashed, the war had come to America. And so we were just, I guess you'd call a remnant, a, a surviving group that had made their way to that area. And we were able to meet other, uh, I mean, it wasn't just Jesus all by himself. There was other heavenly beings that were there to guide us and help us. And so that was a great peace. Mm -hmm. We go through this life right now, and we don't hear of heavenly beings or any heavenly help, really. That's true. But it was such a relief to see the orchestration, the organization. Jesus is the head of this organization, but he has so many helpers, and... Um, the Bible talks about the resurrection, and a lot of these people that have, were resurrected at the time of Jesus Christ were there to help him, some of his disciples, and, and women, me, honestly, there were a lot more women than men that were there serving and just helping the mortals to mm -hmm. accomplish their task. But yes, that you titled your podcast Fill the Fire and that's exactly how it feels it's a happy holy feeling that can fill your whole body well that's what we talk about is that it's a heavenly fire like it's not a mm -hmm. fire like we have fire and big campfire it's not like a bonfire mm -hmm. it's, a heavenly, right. it's a heavenly fire and mm -hmm. Mine usually comes like from my chest area, just kind of exudes out from that area. Just like a burning, like a powerful feeling. But you felt that in his presence, but did you also feel like, what are like some of his personality traits? Because I'm interested in like, obviously he was powerful, but like a calm power or what do you, what are your ideas of his personality traits? Um, kindness. There wasn't a sense of judgment at all. He was mm. happy for the progress we'd made in our lives. He was always so kind. There were a couple of scenes I could see where my grandchildren went up to him a little bit timidly, mm -hmm. but he just bent down on one knee and and held his arms out and they went right to him and he just held them tight and smiled up at us as we watched him give them a hug and it's almost like a, you know, like a heat, almost a radiant mm. feeling coming off of him all the time. And so just complete acceptance for who we are, wanting us to strive and do better, but I don't know why he kind of singled me out a couple of times mm -hmm. and as if we knew each other pretty well mm -hmm. and he would joke a little bit with me uh, nothing was too serious he said not to take things too seriously and just to 
move forward and, and not be too hard on ourselves. And I think that's a key principle that we need to remember. And I, I could feel that the atonement of Christ, the forgiveness, the repentance, and all of that, we'd already been taught that, and in many ways we'd already been through the process, and so we felt like we were living the way we should, and so we were accepted by him, but I also sensed that he feels that way about everybody, no matter what stage in life they are, whether they're going through deep trials, maybe they've committed great sins, but he still reaches out just like he did with those grandkids I looked at. I saw him hug. He's reaching out to everyone. During my teenage years, when my family wasn't really that religious, I, in our church, there was a painting of Jesus, and he looked almost, you know, a little frightening, kind of a probably 1600s painting of Jesus that they had on the wall. And so I'd look at that painting, and he did not seem friendly at all. And I just was a little bit afraid of him. I didn't, that might be part of why I didn't feel a connection to him or didn't even seek one out, really, as a teenager, because he seemed so distant. But now with a greater perspective and having seen some of these visions, I can tell that he, that's the last thing he is. He's very close to us. Mm-hmm. He's right there if we'll reach out mm-hmm. for him, even in our daily lives now. We don't have to wait until the future to, to fill him in our lives and to have heavenly help in our lives every day. What would you say, Chad, to um, our listeners that are desiring for more experiences, be it, you know, the baptism of fire experience? um, And and what do you think maybe even Jesus would say to, for them to have hope that that can happen for them? Because most people, like you said, do not feel worthy or they're hard on themselves or they, they have this unbelief. And maybe you can describe more of a way to believe in him. Um, just from your experiences with him, that would help other people have hope that that can happen for them. Okay. I would say that that experience I had as a missionary was my baptism of fire, where I felt encompassed in the Savior's love. And it had been a process. I'd read the scriptures and gotten to know the Savior finally. It does take a little bit of effort on our part. And then as we open our heart to Jesus, then he can fill us with that, what I call the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, just a feeling of fire, uh, burning, but it is, it is a real experience that actually changes you inside and out. And so a lot of people have those experiences and don't recognize them. They expect to see angels or something, but that burning of the bosom is, is the first step. And people often don't feel worthy to receive that, but it's not a matter of worthiness necessarily. You need to just have that desire to accept the Savior and that will be the first step to a stronger relationship with him and to be able to get to know him better. Uh, Like I said, I didn't hardly know him at all when I had that experience, but it opened the door that I could move forward, and I want people to know that anybody can go through that same experience. Uh, I was just a kid from a small town who just played sports his whole life. He I hadn't really paid the price for that wonderful experience, but it was granted to me. And everyone has that opportunity if they'll just reach out. It does require putting away a lot of worldly things and to focus and study a bit on in the Bible and just get to know the Savior himself. And then those experiences will occur. I love that. Can you also describe for us, like, what he looks like? I always want to hear it. What does he look Um, like to you? So Chad is describing something he really loves, and that's sports and him playing sports. In fact, 
he hoped to go pro. But Lori seems to get quite bored with the description of Chad. And as they continue, well, he continues describing, you know, his life and how Jesus relates to him. Lori interrupts him and suggests that he talk about Jesus and what he looks like. And this seems to excite her immensely, guys. So this is kind of important to me because it seems that Lori's very interested in Jesus Christ himself, his traits, his personality, you know, and and she just seems and when you listen to her voice, the state that she seems to be in, in my opinion, it's almost like an abnormal excitement, if you get what I'm saying. So the purpose of this podcast should be to bring people closer to Jesus. And he's trying to tell people how to do that. And uh, if they just do it through studies and things like that. And she's like, Ugh, I want to hear more about, you know, did he have calm powers? What was his traits? What was his personality? She's just fixated and has this abnormal curiosity, in my opinion, to Jesus Christ himself. And as you can tell, Chad is leading people to believe that he has been singled out by Jesus a few times. And later on in this podcast, you'll notice he'll start saying that his family has a special connection connection to Jesus himself. I want you guys to concentrate on Chad's voice and his emotion in his voice or lack of. In my opinion as well, it shows a lot of who he is and who he says he is. So Chad has described that he felt no judgment from Jesus whatsoever and he felt nothing but kindness. Again, he's like an emotion when he says these things. It's just a very straight line. He has a long pause. What Lori says, I love that. And uh, he, she asked him, can you just describe what he looks like? So what does this mean? The way that she's asking about, you know, what he looks like. And to me, she doesn't seem interested in the lessons or visions so much as she's interested in him. The long silence that Chad Daybell has when she asks him that, again, this is a second long silence and this one is longer than the one before. It seems like a very awkward moment, but what kind of awkward moment is it? What is going on in his brain? He has some kind of conflict going on, but you don't know what it is. Anyways, like in Chad's books, he also relates his children to his visions and they take a big part in meaning, at least to Chad. Interesting choice of words, again, is the organization that Jesus will come down with other heavenly figures to help the mortals build before the second coming of Christ. Guys, I'm going to have to end it here. I'm really uh, working my butt off. So let's go ahead and end it here. Thanks, Kesha. Thanks for sharing this with us. I was able to do this commentary and actually, you know, learn a lot more about, you know, what they're saying, the type of people they are and compared to their true timelines. So don't forget, we have girls still missing out there that their stories are just kind of going cold. And we need you guys to keep them alive. You guys have a great weekend. I love you guys. And I'll come up with part two on this when I can while continuing to work on this series. Have a great weekend, guys. See you soon.